I hope it's correct. Um, so this is the human hacking talk. Um, I have been referring to it by the subtitle of how to get open source people to do what you want. Um, a bit about me, um, I'm Emily Dunham, E. Dunham on the internet. I'm an active open source contributor, a leader of various things, including um, a couple different robotics clubs back in the day and the OSU Linux users group up until very recently. Um, an amateur student of psychology and an OSU student um, down in Corvallis, Oregon. So one disclaimer with this is that a lot of the things I'm going to discuss today are kind of further from having objectively correct answers than you're used to in open source. Um, these ideas are also almost impossible to communicate without a bit of spin or bias toward the presenter's own worldview. So if you currently have a worldview that makes you really happy and don't want to change it, you don't have to change it just because I told you things about how people work. Um, and also, try to approach this whole topic of human hacking or getting people to do what you want with a scientific mindset. That's kind of a pragmatism or the idea that you go, what happened, why did it happen, and how will changing the things that made it happen change the results next time, rather than trying to impose a lot of structure of, oh, this is right, this is wrong, this is what should have happened. Now, if it, if it didn't happen, then that's not actually what should have happened. Um, so this is basically um, about getting what you want. Like, that's what I expect that you're here to learn based on how my abstract was written. Um, there's kind of a be careful what you wish for clause, is you identify what you want, you kind of ask if it makes life better or worse for you and the people around you. Um, if it's something that you've never had before, like, oh, I want everybody to share their login information with everybody else and this will make the internet a better place. So we're just going to force them all to share it with each other whether they want to or not. Talk to people. See if everyone would agree with you that it's actually an improvement. Um, if you think that you want something that's just generally harmful to everybody, examine why you want it and see whether that underlying desire could be satisfied by something else, something that doesn't mess up the community, um, something that doesn't ruin other people's lives. So before you can get what you want, though, you have to know what you want. Um, typically, you're here because you want a project to listen to you, you want to get involved with open source of a particular um, sort or what have you. If you don't know what you want, then I can't help you. Um, maybe spin up an Elizabeth instance and talk to her until you get some ideas. Um, anyways, an outline. Um, all knowledge, or all fields of knowledge, have kind of a circular dependency. You, you learn it and then you learn more about those original things and so forth. So I've tried to break it at the part with, fewest, with the fewest um, dependencies back. And that's how a single individual works. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk, so if this seems like an illogical way to break down the topic, um, I'll have my contact information at the end. Please let me know. Please let me know your feedback, where you think I'm right, where you think I'm wrong, because um, I would love to improve it and keep working on it. So basically, why people do things. Pro tip, you right now are living in a human emulator. It's called a brain. It helps you predict the reactions and behavior of people similar to you. This is a mixed blessing. Um, you can predict the people who are similar to you really well, but sometimes it won't predict the people who are dissimilar from you, who are working with different information, have different experiences. But for the most part, it's reliable about basic things. Um, so a few models before we really jump into open source culture. Um, it sometimes helps to examine individual humans and look at what psychology generalizes about just everybody. Um, one generalization I really like when examining people's motivations is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And what Maslow said is basically that you can't go on to wanting the upper needs until you've got the lower needs fulfilled. So if, for instance, someone is in a situation where they don't have enough food and yet that they have friends and family and they're in their house visiting and they say, oh, don't eat out of my refrigerator, but you're literally starving to death, that lower physiological need of I need to eat is probably going to overwhelm the love or belonging needs of, oh, I need to be true to my word and good to my family and do what they said and stuff. And you're probably going to take their food even though you, uh, they told you not to. Um, this also kind of helps you prioritize, like, if someone is threatened, if they think that their physical safety is in jeopardy, 
then they're not going to continue behaving as if they're trying to fulfill the needs above that. Um, so that's kind of a generalization of things that are common to all people. Uh, there's also a useful generalization, well, a variety of them, that break apart the differences in people's approaches to various things. One of my favorites of these um, is the Myers-Briggs type indicator. It basically, it takes four different axes. Um, each one is a spectrum between two extremes of the ways that you interact with the world. And breaks people down into groups. And then the really useful thing about the MBTI is there's a lot of supporting documentation that tells you conflicts that you should expect or um, places where people of different types can be expected to maybe work well together or to maybe kind of clash with each other's priorities. So um, basically, the attitudes of extroversion versus introversion are, um, they're like, do you focus mainly on the external world, which is extroversion, or an internal world of ideas and kind of thoughts and reflection, um, introversion. So the functions of sensing versus intuition and thinking versus feeling, um, they say basically one of them is kind of dominant, um, but you'll typically have a preference between sensing, which is going for things that are really present and tangible and concrete, versus intuition, which is your motiva uh, you go more with abstract, theoretical, or association-based um, ways of information gathering. And then thinking versus feeling is for decision-making. If you're a thinker, you probably try to be rational, try to be data-driven, um, to really prioritize logic and rules for decisions. Versus if you're somebody who operates more for feeling with your decision-making, then you go based on association or empathy or prioritizing the consensus of a group. And then to represent that one of those previous uh, four types is dominant, you have the judging versus perceiving. And basically, if it says you're judging, that just means that you prefer thinking or feeling. If you're perceiving type, that means that you just kind of prefer sensing or intuition. So it's an interesting inventory. Um, points out a lot of the places where people can be different. But it's self-reported and seeks to understand and not to like categorize people whether they'd be a good fit for a given job. One thing to note in tech is that the um, IN type of types are really rare in the general population. They're closer, like INTP is like 15% in the general population, and yet when you give it to a room full of tech people, you'll have a much higher percentage. Um, so that's one way of generalizing about people. Another really useful generalization, um, that's just, I have marshmallows because there's a marshmallow test where they, um, they would give kids a treat and then leave them alone with the treat and say, ah, don't eat that treat. If you don't eat that treat, I'll come back in five minutes with another one, and then you can have two. Um, people have varying, uh, very different abilities to postpone having that treat in order to have something nicer in the future. And then everybody has some kind of personal narrative or monologue, something that they tell themselves about who they are and about why they're a good person and about why their life goes the way it does and so forth. I'm going to refer back to that pretty frequently because that's one of your most powerful tools for motivating someone to do what you want. So, pop quiz. Raise your hand if you think that humans are basically reasonable. Okay, two or three. Yeah, um, you guys have probably paid a lot more attention to people because a lot of people will, um, often not engineers, will have an inner monologue that's like, yeah, people are, people are basically reasonable. Um, People are not. You guys already know this. No big surprise. <laughs> we have a lot of cognitive biases. There is a huge list on Wikipedia that I will link for you later, and I'll have my slides up on Lanyard so you don't have to write down the links or anything. Um, cognitive biases tend to have negative connotations to them, but they're not necessarily good or bad. They're just places where the brain tends to deviate from what you would expect if it was a computer. Um, so, quick quiz. Raise your hand if you think you're better at driving than the average person in this room. Oh, okay. That <laughs> didn't work the way it was supposed to. <laughs> driving is... Oh, yeah, that was like zero hands for those of you listening to the stream later. Um, so, that's one where classically people overestimate their own driving skills. Um, 
I probably should have said better than average, but we might just have a room full of really good drivers. Um, this is typically... Or really bad. <laughs> this is typically an overconfidence effect. Um, so overconfidence effects such as, have you ever had to do a time estimate for a software project and gone, oh yeah, I can get that done in a day, three weeks later. Um, so we ran into this difficulty. <laughs> yeah, that's the planning fallacy. Um, people tend to, um, I guess non-engineers tend to have overconfidence in different areas from where engineers do. Next pop quiz, which is probably going to go again, maybe the opposite. Raise your hand if you think you're better at coding than the average person in this room. <laughs> okay. Like four people out of like a 20-person room. Um, that works better for the point that I was trying to prove with it, which is underconfidence effects. Um, like the black dog could totally eat the white dog for breakfast, but it's scared. It doesn't realize that about itself. Um, one interesting incarnation of this that's more well known among um, in the literature of people encouraging diversity in tech and wondering why people of different backgrounds don't come in, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's a cognitive bias where unskilled people think that they're better at what they're doing, whereas skilled people are better at um, judging their own skills and tend to way underestimate their own abilities. Um, so that's neat to read about. There are a lot of cognitive biases out there. The Wikipedia page would be many pages long if you printed it out. But that's not what this talk is about. Um, I want to make sure to have enough time for um, neat stuff about how you actually apply this to open source leadership. So with all of these generalizations about people, before we go on to discuss um, interpersonal interactions, just bear in mind whenever you're looking at them, whenever you're working with them, whenever you're trying to apply them to people, that generalizations are only useful in as much as they help you ask the right questions. They help you ask questions you mightn't have asked before. Like, if you have a particular approach to a problem and someone else has a different approach, and you're like, oh, they seem to be an extroverted personality type. If that causes you to go, oh, well, that means they won't understand my logic, you've just failed. If it makes you go, hmm, I should make sure to ask how they feel about this, then congratulations, you're kind of succeeding and you're probably um, making them think more highly of you. And differences between people are not necessarily flaws. Um, a trait that's a huge strength in one context can be just as big a weakness in another. So you should never assume that you have enough context about a person or about a situation. Um, assuming that you know background, which and having those assumptions be incorrect is one of the best ways to put your foot in your mouth and make people um, hate you permanently, potentially. Just accidentally burn bridges that you didn't mean to burn. So when you try to get communication between more than one person, between a small group of people, you can kind of regard each individual based on the traits that affect a single individual, but you get more things into the equation. You get social scripts, especially whenever you're in well-defined social roles. Um, I honestly think of them as kind of like the conversations with NPCs in a video game. I mean, they're people. I'm not saying that the person you're engaging in a social script with isn't a person at all. Um, just like if you kill the guard, the gu other guards are going to be very, very angry. But there are uh, rules that govern certain interactions. Um, one tip that I've found is if you have anxiety about a particular social um, situation, like I personally despise making phone calls, um, you can get help from a friend who's good at handling that situation to help you even just write out the script of how you can expect it to go and prepare your responses. Um, they'll feel good because people like feeling like they've helped one another. That friend probably has somewhere in that internal monologue, yeah, I'm a good person because I'm a good friend to my friends. And when you let them do a thing, that they go, oh, I was a good friend by helping this person deal with the call that they were anxious about, then they'll feel better when they're going to sleep that night. They'll be like, yeah, I did something good today. And um, it makes a good impression of you. Which brings us to um, reciprocity. Ben Franklin effect is tangentially related, but people generally like helping others, especially people in open source. I mean, that's kind of why we're here, more or less. We like solving our own problems, but we like solving our own problems and helping others and making others help us and so forth. Um, ben Franklin effect, like that quote, um, suggests 
if someone, if you get someone to do something for you, then they'll be even more likely to do things for you in the future than if you did something for them, is kind of plays on another um, fallacy or cognitive bias called attribution error. If somebody sees themselves doing a thing, like, oh, why, I appear to be helping this person, um, then they will kind of make up a backstory to it. Like, oh, I must have helped them because I like helping them. Okay, then I'll help them again. Um, so another thing that comes up in interpersonal interaction is body language, which I'm sure you've all been told about this. Um, they explain it when they're telling you how to do interviews and so forth. You can tell what the guy is thinking by how he's standing, um, look on his face and so forth. Um, but body language shows up, um, has exact parallels almost in online communication as well. Your tone of voice is conveyed by your sentence length and sentence structure and punctuation. Again, use that human emulator, that brain, to think, how do I judge others? Because this is probably related to how they're judging me. You see a post on a mailing list. How can you tell whether the person knows what they're talking about? How can you tell their age, their level of education? It's by um, that body language of communication. Um, your word choice can kind of correspond to your style of dress or your accessories. Are you being kind of pretentious and showing up in a suit where you shouldn't and using big long words that people are going to have to look up? Are you putting things in smaller words than you need to and kind of condescending or like being underdressed for the occasion? Um, a people's presence or absence in an IRC channel can kind of correlate um, if they rage quit to stomping out and slamming a door. Um, interrupting with off-topic or inane remarks kind of correlates to being fidgety and attention-seeking in meat space. Um, and typing really slowly, unless people know to expect that from you because of some situation that you personally have going on, kind of has the same impact as a mumble or a stutter. Um, and finally, your email address, your handle, your signatures uh, on email or forums, basically give everybody that first impression of you. They're, what people can see about your age, your style of dress, your gender, your haircut, that um, is harder to change in real life, but easy to control online. Um, another thing that relates to this body language of the internet is mirroring behavior, and I'll get more onto this when I talk about communities. Um, the way that somebody communicates will typically tell you how they want to be communicated with. Um, try, if you're going out of your way to get along with someone or to have them approve of you and want to help you, mirror their communication style. If they prefer sending emails, then send emails rather than insisting that they talk on IRC or on the phone. Um, and most people, unless they've been trained or trained themselves in psych psychological knowledge, will tend to assume that everybody else thinks and feels and prioritizes stuff more or less the same way they do. This gives you very useful tells about what their priorities are. So. One sort of non sequitur here is that to invite conversation with somebody, if you're just getting involved in a channel or you just, you're just like, I want to make friends, talk to me. Um, pay attention to what makes you feel safe and relaxed approaching a person and then try to, con uh, to create those same traits in the environment if you want people to approach you. So being present, calm, and engaged in shared channels or subtly solving a problem that they're having. Even if this means you go into the project's channel and, oh hey, a newbie wandered in who's even newer than I am, and they asked a question that I know the answer to. If I answer that newbie's question, I've subtly helped out the older community members by preventing them from having to context switch out of their day and um, deal with that. So this brings us to more communication skills. Um, effective email. So, Using that human emulator, which emails are still in your inbox, even though you know that you really should have done something with them a long time ago? And why are they still there? Um, typically, you can help people out. You can make it easier for them to help you by using a good title, keeping it down to one ask per message, um, summarize what you're saying with bullet points, and anticipate questions. Like, know your audience and know your purpose. Um, and something that shows up in groups is social capital. So this is something that you're gaining or losing. It's kind of like karma, but it's not quantified in internet points. It's quantified in people's opinions of you. Um, 
So you give somebody upvotes, that's positive karma. You identify yourself as a fan of My Little Pony, that might not be such good karma depending on the context that you're in. Um, the essentials here are really don't lie to sound cool. There are stories about people who get into an interview and they're like, oh yeah, I'm an expert at using that open source project. I've written so many things in it, I'm a core contributor to it. And then they find out the person interviewing them is actually one of the original authors. Very few things are more embarrassing than that. Um, so another, another point about social capital is that when you recommend somebody for some job or for some project or for some permission, you're gambling your social capital on them. Um, if you if that person really screws it up, really bombs the interview, embarrasses you, then you've lost social capital by investing it in that person that didn't turn out to be worth it. If the person turns out to be super cool, then pe you've gained social capital because people go, oh wow, they really have neat friends. Um, and then another useful trick that comes up um, in open source projects are stalking skills. I call it stalking, it's really just a use of the information that people share about themselves naturally um, in order to generally save them effort or get in contact with the people you want. So stalking skills on GitHub. Um, you're stalking a project, look at its commit graph. Um, there's a little graphs thing down in the lower right on a GitHub project and it'll tell you who's been contributing recently. Maybe the person listed as the main contact um, on the page, got a bunch of commits in two years ago, but hasn't touched it since, and somebody else has been pushing regularly lately. That somebody else is probably the person you actually want to talk to. Um, IRC stalking skills, know your who is, know how to look up um, people's uh, in NickServe to see who registered a given Nick. Um, read their cloaks to see what project they're affiliated with. So, for instance, Earlier today, when I've been, I've been trying to put names to faces of all the Seagull organizers the whole time, I've been who -ising people in the channel and comparing it to the program, and that's just a way of saving them um, time and effort. So you can use your stalking skills on news articles if there's a given project and somebody's been interviewed for it, or if the person has just been in the news for whatever reason. Um, one caution here is that if you Google someone personally, you might find out things that you didn't necessarily want to know about them, and you can get this feeling that you've really violated their privacy by doing that. So before you really dig in depth about a person, be prepared, be like, is this worth it if I find out something, if I find them on some site and I'm going to have to work with them every day, and I'm like, I didn't want to know that about you. Yeah, Deb? Put software, when you Google someone, and you want to know work stuff, put at least software or free software or open source software into the search. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. usually that. keep away from the things you don't want to know. Yep. Typically, either a project name or free or open source software will uh, narrow down your queries to keep out the stuff you don't want. Um, yes. Turn safe search on. Yes, turn safe search on. <laughs> with <laughs> wise life advice. Um, wow. So, Sometimes people will have a personal site or blog, especially if they aren't wearing a cloak on IRC and they have like their username.net. There's probably a site there. It's kind of neat if you're just chatting with somebody in PM, making friends with them. They're like, oh yeah, I noticed that you have a site. Um, and that can give you something to talk about. Um, and yeah, if their host mask or email is at a custom domain, it's kind of neat to check out what's there. You usually won't find anything too terrifying if they're smart and using this as a professional identity. So. With that, let's talk about big groups of people. Have you ever tried to get anything done by committee? Yeah, um, open source is kind of like that, and yet we somehow get things done. Um, so I like this quote. Haven't actually seen the movie, just really like the quote. A person is smart, people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Things start to change when you're no longer looking at a handful of individuals behaving as individuals, but a bunch of group members behaving as members of that group. Um, Relative, relevant to free and open source software, um, a meritocracy is basically energy invested measured in lines of code. So we're kind of, many projects are working on changing that, measuring energy invested in this cause, measured in actual contributions like writing the documentation or helping the newbies so that the coders can actually go code or publicizing it so that you have users. Um, but 
that's one of the sort of problems with the meritocracy definition, and you can help with that by recognizing the contributions of the people who make your project possible, not just the people who get commits into the tree. So let's say you're involved with the project. How do you get them to take you seriously? Um, a few rules of thumb. Don't use a ridiculous handle. Um, as I say in my IRC talk, if I were to go online and put my nickname as, oh my gosh, it's a girl on the internet, and then everybody like PM'd me and went, oh my gosh, it's a girl on the internet. You, I, what did I expect to happen? Um, don't have a handle that discriminates against anybody because, surprise, surprise, the person with the commitment bit to get your patch in might be a member of that group. Um, and this kind of goes along with mirroring, but conform to the expectations of behavior for that particular channel or list. Um, when they say lurk more, they mean go read the backlog, figure out what the social rules are before you go and do a thing that breaks them. Um, one place where those expectations have really shown up to me is GIFs versus no GIFs in emails or in pull request comments. Um, I worked at a big corporate place for one internship and if you put a GIF in your email, you might have been fired. Everyone would look at you funny. Um, and then I worked at a small recent startup. And if you send an email without a cool cat GIF that's thematically appropriate, you're kind of lame. Um, and then the next major trick to getting taken seriously is to ask your questions well. So the tricks to asking good questions, it's basically, you can think of a good question like a Mad Libs hey, so I was trying to do this thing, and I read the documentation at this place, which told me to do it this way, but that didn't work. I did this thing, and instead, that other thing happened. What went wrong? Where should I go? Or whatever quest it happens to be appropriate. The format in the short format is, I wanted X, I did Y, I got Z. If you explain a bit of why you did why, um, that will help them out as well. That will probably be the next thing they ask. But by anticipating the community's questions, you're showing that you respect their time. And if you link to their docs, um, that will show them that you actually read the docs and make them very, very happy, especially whoever wrote the docs. Um, so looking at different routes into a project, I will be right back on that topic of documentation because there are a bunch of different ways to get involved with open source. Um, different people recommend different techniques. One way is to just use the product until you find a bug and then fix that bug and submit it. That's cool, right? Find a contributor you know and get them to mentor you and introduce you to the project. That's really good for telling you the kind of social rules and expectations. Um, one way of getting involved in open source is starting your own project and having it open source. I wouldn't recommend this for your first project because you can learn so much from other people's mistakes. But then there's my personal recommendation, which is, I call it the help with install docs technique. Basically, you go up to a project that you think is cool for whatever reason, and you try to install it. And you inevitably run into some problems, and you're following some guide that they published, and then you figure out how that guide could have been written to have prevented the problem that you had. And then you go to their channel, and you go, hey guys, I'd like to make it easier for newbies to get into this project. I have identified these changes that we could make to the install docs that would make it easier for newbies. Um, could you guys help me like, get these changes in? And if they go, oh, we don't care about newbies, go away. You've just dodged a bullet with minimal investment of your time. Um, if they go, oh my gosh, you want to help, our ma you want to help make our docs better? You're writing docs? You're wonderful. Then this is the kind of project culture that you probably want to be in because they value new people, they prioritize their users, and you have an infinite source of get out of dumb question free cards. The get out of dumb question free card is you, you look, you have a problem, you're like, oh, it would be so stupid to ask them that. That's like, I know I should know this. And then you look in the docs where you think the answer should be. And then if it's not there, you go, hey guys, I found this problem a newbie might have, and it looks like we should have it in the docs here, but it's not. Could you tell me the answer so I can put it in the docs? And if you're in one of the good projects, then they'll be like, absolutely, you're great for documenting things. And there you've just answered, you've just gotten the answer to your own otherwise embarrassing question in a way that gains you social karma. Um, so yeah, improving the docs. Um, 
if they're really bad about letting you help with their documentation, you've got to kind of do a little bit of diagnostics, or if they're missing docs entirely, figure out why they haven't been written already, because this can be a red flag if they're not even trying. Is it that they don't think their target audience needs them? Is it the project just doesn't care? Um, or do they just not have enough time, have too much work on their plates fixing the bugs? And if they just have too much work, then by going in and putting some of your work in, you can make everything better. But if there's other red flags going on that they're not going to support you, they're not going to help you, um, then it may not be a good project to invest a lot of your time in. Um, also, make sure you're asking the right people. Use those stalking skills to figure out who gets code into the docs, who's responsible for that, listen in their IRC channels to see who talks more. Um, and sometimes it comes down to a question of changing the project culture. Like, we need people to want it to be better for newbies. Well, that's a really hard thing to do. You can't necessarily change people, especially when they're volunteers. It's often better to find the subset of people who do care and work with them on it. Sometimes this means moving to a new project. Sometimes this means working within the existing project. But if someone's volunteering for something and you try to change their basic worldview on it and make them have a really bad time, odds are that they're just going to quit volunteering for that entirely. Sometimes this is good for the project. Sometimes this is very bad for the project. Um, and with that, sometimes there's people who are kind of like damage. Um, you just have to wrap around them. So let's check my time. Oh, slide 35 of 50, 33 of 50 minutes. I'm doing OK. So story time. Um, about a year ago, a um, year and a couple months ago, I had this huge idea. Let's start the sysadmin training program through the open source lab and reach out to the entire community and like teach people everything they need to know to go from zero to being a competent DevOps in a year and it'll be great. Except I had this one coworker who I knew if I came to him with an idea like that, he would just be like, huh, that's, you know, that's not going to work, right? Get back to work. Stop messing with that. Just don't do it. So instead, um, I and the people who were working with me on that project routed around that damage by getting the <laughs> curriculum, getting the first several weeks of the curriculum all prepped, and then taking it to him and our boss and going, hey, we have this thing. This proves we can do it. And often routing around damage will make the end product stronger, because if it's not worth working around the problems, then you'll just drop it. If it's like not an idea that you care enough about to do well on it, then you just won't bother. Whereas if it's something that you really care about, you really want to put the time into and the effort into and the lines of code into, um, then you will invest that time. So quick case study. Um, as I promised in the abstract, what happens when a project's ignoring your pull requests? Um, you go back to the beginning of the slides. What is it that you want? Are your expectations realistic? Um, Often, if you've gotten feedback from the project on your change request, um, that'll tell you kind of where you've gone wrong. Um, if you're getting no feedback, look at the other pull requests from other people. See whether, see what kind of timeline they get their replies on. If, you're, if nobody ever gets replied to in the first two months and it's only been a day, sit on it for two months and then try again. It might just work itself out. But if people usually get a reply in a day and it's been two months, well, Look at what they're doing differently. Are they people whose next people recognize from a channel or mailing list? Um, are they people, are they different types of change requests? You can even contact someone who gets PRs in regularly and say, hey, do you have any idea what I'm doing wrong here? And then listen to that feedback, thank them for the feedback, and take the feedback. Don't, the worst thing you could do if they give you good feedback of, yeah, you know, that's way too big a change and big changes like that need to be approved by the project maintainers, is to argue with them. You're wrong. This change shouldn't have to be approved. That will guarantee they never try to help you ever again. Um, so if it looks like somebody's just blocked on something, then figure out what's blocking them and figure out whether you can help. Um, maybe. They, maybe you push the port that ports it to Windows and they don't have access to a Windows box. Go, how can I help you with this? Uh, maybe you can run tests for them on your Windows box. Um, and then this magical thing will show up in leadership. Basically, anytime you're trying to get someone to uh, do something, your magic words are, when can I remind you? When somebody says, oh yeah, I'll get back to you and I'll get back to you.
you on that later. I'm busy right now. I'm at a conference this week. I can't talk now, but I'll get back to you later. It's, when can I remind you that you said this? And this puts the ball in your court. It doesn't leave it just forgotten with them, um, because if they're that busy, they probably won't. Um, they probably won't really remember it anyways. And then what you do is you put it on whatever calendar app you choose. I personally use Google Calendar because it emails me by default. You put it on your calendar, you set it to email you on the day when you said you'd remind them. And then on that day, you get an email, hey, remind such and so about the thing. And then you just do it. And then often that will have removed that roadblock for them and you can keep on going. So handful of tricks to leveraging conferences. Um, which kind of ties in with when can I remind you, um, is take advantage of the hallway track. Meet people. Um, politely invite yourself into conversations. Oh, I couldn't help but notice you were talking about chef. I did chef at my internship. What do you think of that, uh, that one cookbook for this thing? Um, that kind of thing. When you get a business card, take that card, write, note, write a note to yourself on it about who the heck that was and why you meant to contact them. And then you will get home from the conference and you'll be like, oh, these are my new friends, rather than who the heck were those people. Um, and just in case you're not um, capable of processing everything right away, make sure you write the name of the conference on it too. Yes, um, write the name of the conference on it, or I typically stick mine in my conference um, folder sometimes when I'm packing to go home, and then I find this um, conference program with a bunch of cards in it, and I'm like, oh, that was such and such a speaker, that's cool. Um, so actually following up on those card exchanges will set you apart. It will make you so unique. You hand out <laughs> dozens of cards at a conference to people who sound really enthusiastic about doing something, getting in touch with you, some job, whatever hardly any of them actually contact you. So if you're one of those people who contacts the person, um, that makes you special. A um, couple of other conference-related tricks. Um, when writing talk proposals, seems like asking questions um, shows them that you know your audience. And um, stop conference abstracts from past years to see what kind of things they accept. Um, figure out what themes, what tones the organizers seem to be looking for and if there's any public correspondence about how the conference is supposed to change this year or how the theme has changed or whatever, make sure you take that into account um, when you're considering what types of proposals are likeliest to get in. So that brings us to, um, I have about 20 minutes to talk about leadership. Um, leadership tends to happen to people who work hard, they're reliable, and they're bad at saying no. So <laughs> this yeah, the people laughing right now, I think you guys end up are uh, leading things, right? Leading projects, leading groups. Um, it goes to the most trusted person who doesn't say no. Um, if you want to get into leadership, then uh, good on you, more power to you. Be trustworthy and reliable and act in the good of the project and mention that you're okay with doing a bit of work. And before you know it, you'll be in charge of something. Open source is great that way. The work <laughs> expands to fill the energy available. Um, so this is the stuff that I wish somebody had told me way back when, um, before I inherited leadership of a robotics club team and a robotics club and a Linux users group and all of these different herds of cats. So step zero, know your audience. I pulled a picture of an audience that was licensed for non-commercial reuse off of the uh, internet. I think this audience likes purple. That's about all I know about them. Um, so try to figure out their goals, their priorities, um, any biases they might have, and what their culture is like. Um, there's often hints in the documentation if it's an open source project audience or, that's your audience or that you're trying to analyze because like what would bring people into this project it's okay to talk to people too. be like hey what's your favorite part of this project why'd you join what were you hoping to get out of it has it been that for you um and know about how much energy and time and resources the various segments of your audience have Typically, the more expert or advanced or veteran people will have less time and energy and resources to go around because they've already got a bunch of commitments that are really important to them. Um, whereas the newer type of people will probably have less time and energy to dedicate to your project because they have other things going on, they're not sure how much they care, and so forth. Um, so know where that, those time and resources are available to you. 
Next point, when you're in charge of a project, is establishing the kind of culture that you want. Um, again, know what you want. Figure out what you want this project to do, what you want its users to get, what you want to get out of leading it, and then figure out what traits in a product, uh, project culture will lead to that. Um, I found that it's nearly universally good to encourage accountability. And for accountability, just be consistent. Um, apply your rules consistently. Um, try to basically give people the benefit of the doubt. If somebody, just assume that somebody chose the best of the options that they were aware of, you can usually fix things by adding more options for them and making sure that they see them as viable. Um, and then I'm going to say this so much, it sounds like a buzzword, but empower people. That means you give people perceived buy-in, you give people investment, you give them the ability to do it themselves rather than ask you to do a thing for them. And that will make your life so much easier as a leader. Um, go. Okay, so um, another thing about culture is remember, so it's become a meme, almost a joke that people say, check your privilege. Privilege literally means private law. When the rules apply differently to one group than another, you've got privilege, you've got discrimination, you've got problems in your project. Um, this is often somewhat inevitable. Oh, we need to keep this core contributor. It will triple the project if the one person who knows how to write those drivers um, has to leave because he said a mean thing. Then you, sh you shouldn't have only one person who knows how to do a given task. You should document more, but it's always a trade-off. But just keep in mind that any time you apply rules differently to different people, congratulations, you just discriminated based on something. Um, keep that in mind when you're setting up your rules as well. So when we talk about delegation, um, when you're a leader and you're like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, I've got so much stuff to do for this group, people are just like, oh, just delegate it. Now, you don't just delegate things. Um, successful leadership, though, in my opinion, is when everybody else does the work and you just kind of point them in the right direction. Um, it makes you less of a single point of failure to the project. It makes you burn out slower. It makes it more enjoyable for everybody involved, better for you because you're dumping less of your life into it and you can keep doing the things, the parts of the project that made you happy to begin with. Better for the people because they feel like they have some say in what's going on. Um, there's also the bus problem. What happens if this one person gets hit by a bus? There's a tool out there I'll just mention in passing called GitBus that will look at a Git repository and say, hey, only this one person has touched these files. If that person got a Git by a bus, um, you would be in trouble. <laughs> so empowering your uh, minions. Am I allowed to call the minions empowering your community members um, <laughs> versus doing it yourself? How do you benefit from burning yourself out and taking on all the work? It's not going to make people think more highly of you. Um, people will really respect you if you can share the work and make sure it gets done. Um, and the other point here is that knowing that a thing will happen is exactly equivalent to knowing who will do that thing. If you're like, oh yeah, somebody will get that, no. Nobody's named somebody else unless they chose a really snarky IRC nick. And even if they did, they probably don't want all of your extra tasks. Um, knowing who will do it, knowing that they're reliable, knowing that they have enough resources at their disposal to get it done, is the only way to be certain that a given thing will happen. With that said, this is the only time that people actually care that much if anybody drops a ball. Um, <laughs> you can... It's way, way better if you're like, I'll get this email sent on Monday and it's Monday night and you're like, oh no, I don't have the stuff for the email. Send it on Tuesday. Don't worry about it. People will be like, oh, we got the email. That's cool. Rather than just not sending it at all. Um, just try not to take things too seriously. Have the mindset that, um, and make sure that it's true, that if someone else cared more than I do about this and really wanted it to happen Monday, they would have been able to do it themselves on Monday. Uh, that's why you empower your minions. Um, and then there's a lot of preemptive problem solving that you can do. Um, you can have, you can set really clear expectations and really clear codes of conduct and I'm kind of getting into the trolls part. Um, <laughs> so clearly communicate expectations both ways. Make sure you know what your group wants to have expected of them and make sure that uh, your group knows what you expect. Um, establish a code of conduct early, 
if you're starting an organization and you can get a code of conduct before you get people, that would be amazing. You, if you've forgotten to get one and now you've got a bunch of people, make sure that everyone currently involved buys in at some level if you're adding a code of conduct. Even if it's just getting people to agree, yeah, this would be a good thing for us to have, I'll go with what the group wants and then have the group vote, and then even if it doesn't agree with each particular individual, they're more or less bought into it. So the reason you need a code of conduct, it's nice, it keeps your group members safe and that kind of thing. It's really to keep you safe. It's to keep you safe when somebody goes, oh, this organization was mean to me and tries to make a terrible uh, scandal about you. You can say, we have a code of conduct. The code of conduct says if you feel like bad things are happening, here's where you go. Here's what you do. Here's the escalation policy on it. And if they follow that policy, then that helps things work themselves out better. Um, if there's, if there's no such policy in place, then people will just do whatever they feel like, which often includes um, saying really mean things about you on the internet to a wide audience, whether or not those things are true. And that audience doesn't fact check. They, it's like why people buy sensationalist media. Um, so to preemptively solve some more problems, avoid making enemies. Be careful drawing the line. Um, between friendships and professional relationships because sometimes with friendships you realize I really need to not be friends with this person anymore. We need to not be so close. And if that was also a professional uh, relationship inside of an open source project especially, that can be really bad for the project. Um, so keep all your communication on the record. IRC is brilliant for this. If you haven't set auto log, I would heartily recommend it. Um, that makes it a lot harder for someone to claim you said something you didn't. Um, and then, if possible, don't feed the trolls. <laughs> but sometimes um, things, there's a problem going on. The, the trolls got in. Things are bad. Keep it from getting worse. Um, don't leak information about who's having the problem. Like, let's say we've got a small group and there's problems with maybe harassment in it, um, and there's only two individuals of the type that one would expect to get harassed, and then one of them stops showing up to meetings and you send out an email saying, an anonymous member of our group has been having problems with harassment. No, they aren't anonymous. Don't, don't leak information like that. Um, like the rules of emergency medical technicians, um, I was in the middle of nowhere, my parents were on the fire department. Step zero, find the patient. Step one, don't kill the patient. Step two, try to make them better. Um, and as I said, discrimination is where the rules are enforced inconsistently. So make sure you have a set of rules that can be enforced consistently and have your project still go. And yet, sometimes you've tried your best and everything <laughs> is still on fire. Um, when you're in the middle of a drama thing, um, one thing that I've had work reasonably well is if someone's just getting gratuitously offended by behaviors that shouldn't necessarily offend them, get them to propose a rule that could be enforced equally on everyone. If they're saying, but you're the leader, you need to magically solve this problem, get them to give you a really clear description of what solving the problem would actually mean. And sometimes that will point out to them that there isn't actually a fair solution available to them. Um, Mirroring and communication style can be a really powerful way of making them a bit more aware of how they're coming across and how they're approaching the problem, but be careful with that. And then sometimes you need to get people out of a project. Uh, legal note, do not throw anyone out of any windows. This is a cartoon character. We all know that cartoon characters don't get hurt when they fall. Real people aren't. Um, so assess the situation. What's best for the group? Um, if someone's just doing stuff because they want attention, how do you avoid giving them the kind of attention they're looking for? Um, figure out why they aren't doing something more useful and less harmful. Um, maybe, maybe they don't have any, in, enough information. Maybe they don't realize they could be going and doing something useful instead. See if you can educate them. Um, maybe hassling your group is just the path of least resistance to their entertainment. Well, you can increase that res resistance until they go troll somewhere else. Like with bots in your channel, set the channel so that only invited or so that only invited people or only identified people can come in. Um, so the really important thing there is to step back from the idea that one person is right and one person is wrong because usually when you're using that idea, it's like I'm right and you're wrong and you're not going to be able to communicate well from that position. 
Um, so past the drama slides. Um, as a leader, how do you avoid burnout? Um, basically, empower the group. Get the people who care most about a piece of work getting done to be the ones who do it because they'll be the ones who are most reliable and so forth. Set realistic expectations, both of the people around you and of yourself. And be willing to forgive yourself because it won't always go according to plan. Um, if you can pick it back up, go, well, now we've done a thing to prevent that from happening in the future and then just move on. Um, that will be way better for your project than if you go, oh no, I made one mistake, I can never come back and drop off the internet. Um, and handing off leadership. If you can plan in advance, like you're like, oh, I'm kind of getting tired of this project. I would like, or it would be good for the project to hand it off to somebody else. Um, start preparing as soon as you realize that the handoff is going to happen. Even if you think you're going to be in charge of your project for the rest of your life, it will make your own life easier if you do this handoff prep kind of stuff right now. So make Mad Libs versions of the, most, of the emails you most frequently send. Like if there's an event that happens every month, and there you, every month you spend an hour composing an email, then make the Mad Libs of that email. Spend five minutes composing it each month, and now you have an extra 55 minutes to do something with. And it makes it so much easier for whoever inherits your job. Um, make checklists of the things that need to happen for events that you put on or for releases of your software that you do and then improve that checklist every time you go through it to keep it up to date, make your life easier to make the new person's life easier. Um, so work with the, the person who's inheriting the group if you have some overlap to make their handoff easier and to make the automation of running the group go better. Um, so that's mostly it on the leadership handoff stuff. Um, one obligatory little mention is that um, brains have bugs in them. Um, be aware of this. Read the kind of CVEs about them. Read um, people's experiences. Figure out how you can work around them and be considerate of people who are dealing with this type of condition. Um, there's, there are excellent talks by Paul Fenwick and others um, on these types of topics. And now we kind of have like six minutes for questions. This is my contact information. My slides will be um, up on Lanyard once I um, get that working, once I figure out some place to host them because they're HTML slides. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people in this room actually know more about my topic than I do. So if you have stories you'd like to share, you have hints you'd like to share, um, things that you think could be improved about this presentation, I would love to know either in email or just right now. Yes? If you find a project mm -hmm. and you want to get involved, but then you realize that you know the documentation the, the is not the stuff for a reason, mm -hmm. but you figure out that this project is probably not right for you. Uh -huh. Is it worth it to tell the community that I'm stepping out and here are my reasons? I would say if you can if you do it in the right forum, it's invaluable information to the community. Uh, so the question again in case the mic didn't catch it was if you start getting involved and then you realize that there's some red flags going on, the community is just not a good fit for you, should you tell them? And I would say um, go to somebody who you've been able to work well with in the community, someone who cares about improving it, someone whose personal narrative says, yeah, I'm a good person because I make this project a better place for its participants, and give them your feedback. Um, make sure it's someone who would appreciate the feedback or be able to use it. I wouldn't recommend making a big public post like on their Facebook or their Google Plus or their mailing list about it because that just sounds like you're begging for attention and demanding that the project kind of bend over backwards for you and will lose you all credibility. However, there are usually people in a project who want to make it easier to work with, better for the community, and your knowledge to them will be just gold. Like. Um, one fun way of making friends with new startups when you like click links on Hacker News or what have you is if you find an app that you really wouldn't use, like it sounds cool but the UI is terrible, send them a love letter, send them an email go, I would not recommend your app to a friend because it's broken in these ways and just list them out. And I've done this a wide variety of times and every time they've gone, thank you so much for the feedback, we never hear from the people who don't like it, it's great. So if you're polite about it, you remember that they want to have an app that people like or they want to have a project that people uh, feel like they can succeed in and contact the right people about it. Um, 
you can get into some surprising communities that way with the negative feedback done correctly. Yeah, Deb? Yeah, I've definitely, uh, when I've given talks to folks about uh, how to bring more people into your community, uh, a couple times I've gotten the question, like, why do people leave? Um, and which is kind of interesting because it, it means that they, they think that there perhaps is like one reason that every single person leaves all different types of projects. Mm -hmm. And the only answer there is like, well, you have to ask them. Yeah. <laughs> and But people do want to know. So they definitely do want to know. You're not leaving to see the light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, figuring out why people left is really important because like maybe it's just family stuff. Maybe they have school. But if a bunch of people keep leaving because oh, such and so, I just can't get along with them. Maybe it's the time for a conversation with such and so. Um, yeah, more questions, comments? Looks like, whoa, we've actually caught up on time. I talk fast when I'm nervous. <laughs> questions, comments, ideas, concerns? <laughs> or not right now. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you learned at least one thing. <laughs>